I'm sorry, I'm starting the recording. Um, so again, this is Scott Eckstein. It's great to have you guys with us. Thanks so much for taking the time. I know there's a lot going on in your lives with the end of school at your current schools, etc. So uh, certainly appreciate you making the time. And, and it's always so exciting to start talking about you guys officially uh, being with us every day. So thrilled to be doing this with you. Uh, I've got Rick Tony, who's the director of studies here with me. He oversees the academic arena of the school. Uh, we also have Steve Buteau, who's the assistant head here, uh, just helping us sort of monitor the comments uh, as they come in. And so a couple of sort of uh, housekeeping items, I guess. One is, again, just for those of you who just joined us, you should be able to see my desktop screen if you're looking at this on a desktop or a tablet. Um, we're going to be showing some documents and, and using that to help you through. I have all of you muted right now so that you can't hear each other, nor can I hear you speak. Um, and the reason for that is just that what we've done in the past, there tends to be a lot of uh, sort of background noise, whether it's dogs barking or uh, doors opening and closing, etc. cetera. So um, uh, we're going to have you muted. And so for right now, if you have questions, use the chat feature. Um, that's you should see on the, on the GoToMeeting uh, section on your right on the screen and, um, and type a question. We'll, we'll sort of go through them as they come and, and, uh, and try to answer all of them, okay? So that's sort of the plan. Um, and then I guess uh, at some point, if you all want, we might unmute you and let you all talk to each other, but we'll see kind of how it goes, all right? Uh, again, this is going to be recorded so that it can be up there. Uh, we'll have it accessible for you guys. I know some of you had kids who were in plays and other types of things this afternoon and weren't able to do it. So uh, I'm going to turn this over now to Rick Tony. Uh, I might chime in a little bit, but uh, but he's sort of the main agenda here for you guys. So uh, there you go. Okay, Rick. Great. Thanks, Scott. As he said, my name is Rick Tony. I'm the director of studies, so I'm in charge of the academic program. I also teach math here, so if you have math-specific questions, I can probably be more, be more specific with those answers. Um, but we will try to get all of your answer, your questions answered uh, through the chat, as, as Scott just mentioned. Um, we're going to try to cover as much as possible and as clearly as we can. There's going to be a lot coming at you, so if you have a question, please type it in the chat um, box, and we'll uh, try to address that question uh, in real time. Um, our plan will be to, to open this up to live questioning uh, at the end, uh, if you have time for that. Um, as we get started right now, though, I thought it would be interesting and fun if everyone types into the chat function, uh, maybe type in where you are from, um, so you can get a, continue to get a sense of, of each other and do it in a way where we're not all talking over each other. So um, if you want to take a moment and type something in the chat, um, that would be great. I want, I want to see someone do it. Who's going to be first? Eric, I'm already. Oh, I'm not seeing. Oh, we're just, we have to scroll down. Oh. oh, hello. All right, great. There we go. All right, thanks for checking in, everyone. You can continue to do that while I continue to talk. Um, <clears throat> the first and possibly most important thing uh, is that you know that we have plenty of time to sort everything out. Make sure you get registered for the right classes and have all the forms done. So uh, today, uh, hopefully we'll have a great start today, um, but uh, I would expect and um, welcome phone calls, face-to-face -face meetings, emails um, moving forward, um, depending on what's most comfortable for you and what's most logistically doable um, for you. Ideally, you will fill out uh, this sheet today your um, course selection sheet um, and return it when it's ready uh, so you'll know what the plan is, what the academic plan is for your child and so that he or she can begin any summer reading or summer work that might be assigned. Some classes have summer work to do but again there's time, there's time for that. Um, so we're going to start with the course selection sheet. Scott's going to open it up here and you, so you can see what we're talking about. Um, this course selection sheet shows all of the courses that are offered that are year-long courses and also courses that are just fall electives. There's a similar sheet for the winter and the spring, but they're much smaller because they only include specifically winter or specifically spring courses. Many of the ninth grade courses are year-long, and so most of your course selection will, will be on this sheet 
the winter and spring, you'll have you might have some to enter there, but mostly you're going to be on this fall trimester uh, course selection form. So we can start um, with a course that just about all ninth graders take, and that's going to be World History Nine. You can find it under Social Studies. Scott, my very able assistant, is demonstrating where World History Nine is. And you can go ahead and circle that. That's how you select to take that course as a year-long uh, social studies course. It's a foundational history class uh, that helps students understand the history of several regions of the world as it relates to the current state of things. Major goals of this World History 9 class are to develop students' abilities to see things from a variety of perspectives, to develop students' research and writing abilities, and to familiarize them with several key historical concepts, such as imperialism. I'm wondering where the course selection sheet is. Gotcha. So, uh, Deb, good question. These are all going to be accessible to you guys um, uh, on the website sort of mid-June. Uh, so don't, don't worry about it yet, okay? We'll be no. okay. And I'll send, yeah, we'll get you an email with these as an attachment, but then you'll also be able to get them through the website. Okay. Thanks for that question. Any others up there? Any other questions above? No, I think that's Okay. It. Oh, wait, here's one. Uh, good question. Um, so, you know, some world history classes are so different. Um, you know, as someone who taught the ninth grade history class here for, for a number of years, I think 15 years, um, world history classes are really just totally different. So um, this will be a, uh, I, I guarantee you this will cover different things. You know, traditional world history classes cover sort of the ancient world and maybe a little European history or something like that. But then um, that's not what this is. So, uh, you know, middle school world history classes by definition going to be different, uh, not just in content, but also in skill expectations and um, level of material, etc. Right. Thanks, Scott. Um, next, let's look at science, um, and in science, most ninth graders will take conceptual physics, and uh, which you'll see again towards the top of the list. Many of these courses are listed uh, more or less chronologically, so mo many of the ninth grade courses will be towards the top. Um, conceptual physics um, is a requirement for graduation at Solbury, but some students will defer and take that in 10th grade and instead opt for chemistry in the community in ninth grade. Um, Scott's highlighting that. So it's going to be one of those two courses. Sorry about my artwork, by the <laughs> way. Uh, it's really not my strongest uh, area. Um, once those, those two courses, uh, physics generally lays the foundation in ninth grade, and then many students uh, will take chemistry uh, in tenth and then biology in eleventh. Um, um, no, we can do that later. Just a second. Um, after biology, at the tail end of the curriculum, as you can see, next year we're offering AP Physics, AP Chemistry. Um, we have elective courses in Human Anatomy, in Environmental Science, in Biomedical Ethics. Um, so there's a lot to look forward to in science. We just sorry, Rick. We have a question about why would someone take Chemistry in the community instead of Physics? It, that, that's really if. If you're someone for whom math is particularly difficult, if you're in our math support program or something like that, um, then the physics class can be a little bit harder, and having that extra year of, of math um, background can be helpful before you take the physics. And so the chemistry of the community is um, a more accessible chemistry class that um, sets people up, I think, to do well in the physics the following year. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Ron. Thank you. Um, one option that's actually towards the bottom, though, of science is Engineering 1, which is an elective course underneath Biomedical Ethics, you might see there. And Engineering 1 is offered all three terms. So you'll see it on this fall form, but you also see it when, the, when you look at the winter and the spring um, forms. And this is an elective course that uh, students can take over and over again, actually. And it's really tailor-made for ninth graders. And if, once students have taken Engineering 1, they can maybe move on to Engineering 2 as well. We have a makerspace, we have a 3D printer, um, so it's, a fair, uh, it's an exciting course uh, that's open to freshmen, uh, elective-wise, in the sciences. Do we have any other uh, questions about science in particular? What is the difference between conceptual 
So um, conceptual physics um, is a physics course. So students are learning about, about motion and velocity, whereas chemistry in the community is a chemistry course. Think, about, think uh, elements in the periodic table. Um, so it's completely different subjects. The difference, uh, one of the differences, chemistry in the community um, allows students to take a chemistry course where the math component is downplayed a little bit. Um, so as Scott mentioned, it's, it's uh, really tailor-made for kids that are in math support, um, whereas conceptual physics is it's a, it's a totally different subject. And uh, s there is a math component to conceptual physics, so some students would benefit by deferring a year and taking conceptual physics in, in uh, 10th grade. Uh, the type of math that's used in physics, uh, generally speaking, is it's, it's at the algebra level, um, solving very uh, basic linear equations and some uh, linear graphs, nothing uh, beyond uh, algebra one. Eric, so the question about community um, and conceptual, the conceptual physics class is really differentiated from sort of a traditional physics class, like the class that maybe you and I took when we were a junior or a senior in high school, you know, we do have an AP physics at the end of the curriculum, which is more um, traditional. Conceptual physics is more like a groundwork course in physics. So it's a, it's a foundational course. We, our science department has led the charge here to have our science sequence be physics, then chemistry, then bio. There's a lot of um, research that says that that's the most effective uh, way to do science education now, given the changes that have happened in the fields. Uh, so we follow that. But for the kids who struggle with math, uh, we, we will put the chemistry first because it's a little easier. Filippo, just to jump to your question about engineering one. Okay. okay. Steve, Steve answered it, but it is it is a class, uh, not an after school thing. For kids after school who want to build stuff and make stuff, uh, our theater tech program is certainly a, uh, a, a great option. Sorry, just scrolling through. Just the, checking the questions. There is Spartan Builder, Builder, Builders, which is an after school. Yeah, it's a during the day club. A, a, a club? Yeah. Yeah. So if a student doesn't get into Engineering 1, he or she still could participate in Spartan Builders. Yes, absolutely. Uh, but Engineering 1 itself is a full-fledged class and earns credit. Anything else about science? Yeah. Okay. okay. All right, now the best subject of all is math, as I mentioned earlier. I can't, I don't know if sarcasm goes through the internet, but um, it is, but it's, it is my field, so I feel obliged to say that. Uh, ninth graders uh, may be in a variety of math courses. Um, generally, uh, Algebra 1, Geometry, on occasion Algebra 2. Scott's circling, there's a, a lot to choose from. Also, at the honors level, we have honors Algebra 1, honors Geometry, and honors Algebra 2. Um, Often your child will take whatever comes naturally after their eighth grade math course. For instance, after pre-algebra, a student that has successfully completed pre-algebra most likely will be um, select Algebra 1. If you have a question about whether Honors Algebra 1 is a better um, placement than Algebra 1, that's a discussion we can have. Uh, we do have math placement tests, but those are generally for um, international yeah, students. Generally, we, we haven't found we needed them for domestic kids. Um, you know, we have um, we have a rec the recommendation from the your, your children's current math teacher, which are very thorough. Uh, that tells us, you know, have they will be they are they on track for geometry? Are they on track for algebra two? Do they need to do algebra one? Uh, so that's really you know that's the main guide of what general course. Um, have they been in an honors course before? Have they been excelling in math? What's their SSAT score for math? I mean, those are all parts of the conversation that, that go into it. And so uh, talking to Rick, and Rick's done, you know, has read all your children's files and, and has looked at it and has some notes. And so, you know, reaching out to him will, will help us figure that out. If there's a debate between the honors and non-honors, uh, we can have, you know, your child meet with, uh, you know, one of the math faculty, particularly the math department head, um, and try to figure that out, and um, and there's also room to maneuver up or down, particularly early in the year, as we try to try to get it right. So there are two good questions that floated by. Steve might be answering them, but I'll also chime in uh, orally. One is, what is the nat natural progression of math courses? Generally, what we do here at Solbury is similar to what many other schools in the states do, and that is, uh, and Scott's pulling up a typical sequence here, um, pre-algebra followed by Algebra 1, and then Geometry. 
So geometry typically gets sandwiched in between Algebra 1 and Algebra 2. And then from there, the higher level classes, pre-calculus and calculus. There are some schools that will do Algebra 1 and then Algebra 2 and then geometry. But that's, um, that's, more, that, that's rarer than how we do it here. This is a pretty typical sequence. The difference between a non-honors course, say, say honors geometry versus non-honors geometry, often it comes down to uh, the depth that, um, the, that the teacher will go into, that the students will go into. Sometimes uh, pace, where the, uh, an honors class uh, may go uh, much faster um, and be able to cover more material than a non-honors class. And on occasion, honors teachers may, may teach from a, a totally different style and something that we would consider to be more rigorous, put more responsibility on the student, sort of more of everything, more homework, uh, maybe more problems. It varies course by course and teacher by teacher, but, uh, but an honors course will be more rigorous, faster paced, and a, and a little deeper than a non-honors course. Other questions about um, math? Well, I want to add one more thing if there are no questions. So I don't yeah. see any. Uh, one last thing about math is that um, some math courses will have summer math work to do, particularly at the higher levels at Algebra 2. Uh, I don't think Algebra 1 or Geometry has much, if at all, uh, summer work. Um, that can be found on our web page. I wonder if, can we show them where that, where that would be? So here's our web page, and, and for summer work, not just in mathematics, but uh, maybe summer reading, it can be found on our web page. So shortly, in the next week or so, there will be, in addition to this blue banner up top, it'll say, uh, like, summer registration or registration. And if you go there, that will have access to all the registration forms you need to fill out, um, including the course orientation, course, course selection stuff. It will have um, the summer reading, the links to the summer, any summer assignments, uh, review packets for foreign language, etc. So uh, stay tuned. Uh, we're just finalizing a couple of things, but in this blue bar, uh, it's probably elsewhere on the on the website too. But in this blue bar, there'll be something for registration information and something like that. Okay. And as you can see on this page, towards the bottom, the uh, academic bulletin for next year is available. Um, it's a PDF, and that includes every course that's offered next year. Um, it includes important information about grading and attendance and honors. Um, uh, so that's available for you to download, um, print it if you like, uh, but that will give you some more clarification about the different courses um, uh, that are offered next year. There was one other question about Algebra 1 at the same time as physics, and that's perfect. Uh, Algebra 1 and concepts of physics complement each other very well, so they can absolutely be taken concurrently. We have another question about a counselor that helps guide you with course selection. So, um, you know, we'll go a little out of order here. Um, but this sort of topic, advisor selection, I'll jump in and, and do that now, which is fine. So over the summer, I'm going to sit down with the head of the uh, advising system here, and we'll go through every new student, and I'll bring my knowledge of, of the student and sort of who they are and their interests and what they need together with her. Um, we tend not to do that until, until the schedules are somewhat selected because we want to know who their teachers are. Now, for most ninth graders, we know who's teaching the ninth grade classes, and so that part's pretty easy, so we can figure that out. But, you know, ideally you want someone who obviously is going to have a lot of contact with your child. So in terms of courses, course selection right now, Rick is really the, the prime uh, contact point for you guys, okay? Again, he knows the academic program. He knows he has read the files of all the new admits. He has read... Um, the recommendations, etc. And so he's your point person, and certainly I'm available to help as needed, um, but he's, he's probably going to be your, your most important person right now. Once the year starts, um, then certainly uh, the advisor will be a, a really important person for you to make sure that they're in the right, sec right level of things and to select classes as they go forward. You know, while you're going to select classes for the fall, winter, and spring, in this initial moment, there's always room to change. There's a drop ad period every trimester, and um, and you also can um, uh, just add a course. So, if like, let's say uh, I'll pick on Filippo because he's asking a question. So, let's say Filippo didn't choose an arts class in the spring, and it gets there, and he feels like, you know, I could add another class, and I really want to take this thing. He can add it then. It, that's that's totally fine. Uh, so you can always you can always do that. So. 
um, you know, the advisor will, will become a particularly important person, but, but Rick is also going to be there for you throughout, as will I. So I'll respond to the question uh, about how many electives um, a student can take. Generally in ninth grade, uh, there is some room for electives. There's not a ton because we want you to get a foundation across a lot of different disciplines. Um, but in our daily schedule, we have two blocks that are set aside for arts. And so uh, it would be perfectly natural and, and um, doable to schedule yourself for two arts electives. That um, includes engineering. Engineering is an applied art, so we have that in, within that scheduled within that time period. And then uh, outside of that time period, in the non-arts classes, uh, you, you probably would have room to take one other elective. Um, I wouldn't recommend doing all of that because you would have absolutely or very little free time during your day and might be overloaded with work. But to answer your question, a, a freshman conceivably could take three electives. I probably would recommend starting with maybe one and then building up from there as you get more comfortable with the school and, and the workload involved. Okay, uh, if we go back to the course selection form, we can look at English, which is um, on the left side. Uh, Solberg students take English every trimester um, from ninth grade through for seventh grade all the way through twelfth. For ninth graders, uh, you would take either English nine, honors English nine, or learning skills English. And learning skills English is at the bottom. Um, if you're not sure whether you're in Learning Skills English or not, we can, we can uh, help you uh, determine that. Uh, the distinction between Honors English and non-Honors English is similar to what I had said about mathematics in terms of pace and the depth of material. If you have a question about which is the best placement for you, um, that's, a, that's a conversation you and I can have. Uh, we might bring in the English department chair, and I certainly would look at your file, and we can make a, a joint decision about the best placement in English. Any questions about English or learning skills English? And just to be clear, if you, if you were accepted into the learning skills program, and you know, I think you know if you were, um, then that tends to be the student's English class. That's the one-on-one -on -one English class that supports them, uh, helps work with their learning differences, helps support their writing, their organization, and supports them holistically. Um, so that's that's great. Uh, sometimes there will be students who, in addition to the Learning Skills English, will also take, you know, the English 9 class, and that's something uh, I have talked to some of you about, and, and you can work with Rick and I can help uh, as we go forward. Okay. Thanks, Scott. Yep. Uh, next up, uh, foreign language on the form, which is uh, I will probably refer to as world language. Um, the placement is based on previous experience. Um, because curriculums vary so widely, for example, Spanish 2 in one school isn't necessarily Spanish 2 in another, um, if you think your child will be in anything other than the first level of a language, they need to take a placement test. These are online, um, they're done at home, and you can, you can print them up, print them, do them at home, and send them in to us so we can deter help determine the right course. Um, if, if you want to sign up for the first level of a language, French 1, Spanish one or Chinese one, you don't need to take a placement test. You can just sign up for those. Um, otherwise, if you want to find a placement test to try to place into a second or a third level, we have it on our webpage. Yeah, and the, again, the navigation of this is going to change a little bit in the next week once we post, once that registration information, sort of summer pieces added to this Navy button, uh, you're going to get it through there. But for right now, um, if you go, it's a little clunky, the navigation, which is why we're, we're doing this. But if you go to academics and then departments, as I just did, and then go to world languages, um, you can see right here the placement exams. And so um, you would click on that, and then uh, they're over here for you. Okay, so you would print that out and, and do that. Uh, Anita, I think, um, so... Anita's question is, can we take the writing class for help? So uh, students who are not in learning skills uh, but, you know, are looking for additional help with their writing have a couple of resources available to them. The most important is their teacher. Uh, and, you know, there's time set in the days in, in the school day to go get help and work on a rough draft, et cetera. Uh, and there's also a writing lab where you can drop in and get help from a teacher or just on a paper, read a draft, get some editing, et cetera. So 
Uh, for David, I'll just I'll speak directly to, to David with your question, Anita. Uh, we didn't feel in the admissions process you needed more help than that. If we change our mind or if you feel you want to talk about it, we can do that. Uh, but students who were, you know, who have not been placed in bridge or learning skills, which are the two support programs that do provide more structured sort of daily help with writing and organization, those kind of things, uh, just the general teacher and the availability they have and the writing lab are, are the resources that students have for, for help with that. Let me see what's typed in there. That's it. Oh, that's it. Okay. Um, yeah, that's it. Where were we? World languages. Any other um, questions? Are there other places? No, the other placement, the only placement tests online are uh, world language. That's all. Any other course for ninth graders to, to select? The only one that, that, that would even be uh, maybe reasonable to do that for would be in mathematics, and we don't do that in mathematics right now. Okay. Uh, just a, a quick reminder, you know, we're going over a lot of details, and, and you know, if uh, research holds and my experience with, with people holds, you'll remember somewhere in the neighborhood of 28% of, of, uh, of what we go over. So. We are certainly not expecting you to, to remember all these details. We're here. We will be here all summer. Uh, there are lots of people who get more summer vacation time than the three people who are in this room. So, um, you know, don't worry about it. And we'll we'll be around to help answer any questions and refresh your memory and sort through all these things. Okay. Okay. We got a couple questions. One is about the daily schedule and how many periods there are in a day. If you did a, a site visit, you would have walked through probably six periods or seven in a day now, but uh, we're changing our schedule and next year uh, we'll have four periods a day. The periods are, generally speaking, they're, they're 80 minutes long um, and your classes meet, generally speaking, every other day. So in the span of two weeks, you'd see your, your classes uh, five out of those 10 days. So you won't have as much you won't have as much uh, homework in every in any given night because nowadays uh, we might have seven, six or seven classes to prepare for, but under the new schedule uh, that would be limited to actually just three. I had mentioned there are four periods of the day in the day. One is an arts block, so um, at most you would have three academic classes in a given day plus maybe one of those arts electives that I that I described. Uh, the day also, in case you visited. Uh, will be different next year in that classes won't start until 8.30 instead of 8 o'clock. And the goal there is to give students a better chance to get the sleep that they need, maybe a, a better breakfast than they uh, are used to, and generally to start the day at a more reasonable, at a reasonable time. Uh, there was another question about uh, summer reading. Um, that's going to be posted on, our, uh, on the website. And it depends, it goes from class to class. It's generally, generally just English and history. Classes are the ones that mainly uh, have summer reading. I think they're still uh, just finalizing a couple of decisions. I think teachers like to switch up the books. But again, once that sort of registration information button is up here, that's, that's going to be where you get the summer, summer reading list. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Ron. I, uh, I think I'm in a similar boat. My <laughs> office is convinced of, of that fact, in fact. That I, in fact, I think 48 seconds that's, is longer than most people think I can pay good. attention for. That's pretty good. All right, we're going to go back to the course selection sheet. Oh. oh, sorry. No, we don't have A's and B days. It's going to be on the day of the week. So Monday is Monday and Tuesday is Tuesday and so on. And they'll, yeah, the schedule will, will become clear, will make sense to you. I, we're not going to spend a lot of time going over it now, but certainly can do that over the summer uh, a lot more. Uh, another question, PE. So the students, as is true for most schools with a boarding component, uh, a boarding program, PE is not a class per se. That's what the, the after school activity program takes care of that. So, um, you know, whether a student's doing a team sport or rock climbing or yoga, uh, that, that fulfills sort of the, the physical aspect of education for us. Okay. School day ends at 3.30. Mm -hmm. The academic, yeah, at 3.30. Um, you know, the academic day ends a little bit earlier than that, and that's part of the extra help time and clubs and stuff is built into the end of the day. Um, good question about the public school buses. Okay. Steve's answering that. The, the simple answer is we're not sure yet. Um, we, are, we are working on it with them. Uh, our private van service will be adjusted to the new start time. Uh, our private vans go out to um, the Yardley area, uh, Washington Crossing, etc. They go out to a number of areas, any place in New Jersey, 
uh, is where our van service goes to. That'll be coordinated. The buses, we're still working with the public school district. They have been more open to talking than we thought, but um, not immediately compliant. So we're, we're working on it. And as Steve wrote, um, you know, the dining hall will be open for breakfast, and, and if kids are here early, just don't feed them at home if the buses won't adjust, and they, they can get a, a wonderful meal here in the dining hall. Uh, so there's a question about the periods in the day and how many courses. Um, this would be a little bit easier with a visual and if we are in person, but I think I can describe it um, a little bit for you. So um, do you have a schedule you're going to pull up? I can get it. Scott might try to pull up a schedule right it's now. It's going to take me a second and you might but see the, my uh, email and things like that. I don't, I don't. The, the easy answer is that if, if, you, um, if you lump together two days, say a Monday, Tuesday, in those two days there are six um, academic classes. There will be there will be two arts blocks, um, six academic classes, uh -huh. and in those six classes, that's where you'll be taking your math and science and and history. <laughs> Are you still looking for it? Yeah, I'm sorry, guys. I'm uh, I didn't. I should have anticipated this. Yeah, but so uh, what happens is over the course of two days, say a Monday Tuesday, you'll have maybe five out of six of those classes spread out. If you took an elective, that would fill up all six of those, obviously. Um, and so uh, over the course of two days, you'd meet all of your classes. You may have a free period if you are scheduled for five academic classes and there's six periods, six academic periods in those, in those two days. Um, so if you don't take an art class, as an example, you'd have some free time. Uh, still looking for the new schedule. There it is. Uh, try that one. There it is. I'm just going to get rid of my email here so it doesn't be. <laughs> so if you just focus on Monday, Tuesday, as I was just trying to describe, the two arts blocks are right after lunch. We call them arts one and arts two. And that's where your arts electives would go. Other than that, the other classes are labeled A, B, C, and then D, E, F. And that's where your academic classes are going to go, as I was saying, your math, science, English, history, and world language. If you took an elective that fell into one of those blocks, say there are some arts classes, say for instance, as an example, art history will be offered in one of those blocks, then all of those letter blocks would be full. And if you choose not to take an elective, one of those 80 minute periods you would have free to meet with a teacher, to, um, to get work done, to just walk around campus. Um, it, so it's, it's up to you in terms of uh, how many electives to, to put into your schedule and, and fill your time. Similarly with the arts blocks, if you take two arts classes, they would be in the arts one and the arts two, and that time after lunch would be, would be full of, of arts classes. And if you choose not to take any arts classes, well, you need to take them eventually, by the way. It's a graduation requirement. But as a freshman, if you don't take any arts classes, that would be time from 12.15 until 1.35, um, again, to get your work done or to meet with teachers. We can get a copy of the schedule out to you. I believe it's posted somewhere online, but I would need to track it down. Um, there was also a question about after-school activities. Um, so, Vic, you, kids sign up for one activity, uh, one after-school activity a trimester. Okay, so they might do uh, soccer in the fall and yoga in the winter and theater tech in the spring or something like that. There are you know, numbers of choices that you can go over with those. Okay. Oh, you know what? I just sent that to Filippo. Sorry. Instead of, okay. So if you have specific questions about the schedule, um, I'm also the point person for that. Um, so we certainly can talk about that one-on-one. -on -one, and um, we'll make sure to get you a link to or send you an email copy of what this new schedule looks like. Um, as you can see, it's on a Monday through Friday um, block. And I paired up Monday and Tuesday. Obviously, Thursday and Friday go together. Wednesday is a little bit more confusing. Um, you, as, if you look at it carefully, you'll see there's no arts classes on Wednesday. And instead, we, we split the day only into three periods, um, either A or D in the first period, B or E in the second, and then C or, C or F in the third. It gives us more time for actually a later start. That's a 9 a.m. start. It gives us some flex time to meet with teachers. The blue box um, in the middle allows you to find teachers for, for um, 45 minutes to get extra help. And it allows for community time at the end of the day from 1.55 until 3.30, where, 
where we have assemblies, we might have clubs, uh, uh, all sorts of things may occur in there. So the Wednesday, as you can see, is a little bit different. Uh, there was a question about mandatory study time each day. So boarding students obviously have an evening study hall. Um, learning skills students will have a little more structured time. If they have a free letter block, they will have uh, an organized study hall for sure. Um, depending on the time of the day, um, we're probably not going to study all every single period, but there will be some blocks in the day where, where there'll be some structured study halls for kids as well. Um, and I think there was another question. I just got the mandatory activity until 5.30, answer that. In the yeah, so Eric, right, the, okay, so uh, the mandatory until 5.30, that's the after school activity. Uh, so Margo is an hour and 20 minute class period long. It's longer than we've done it, uh, for most of the classes, although we've had 80 minute classes in one of our blocks for a long time. Um, you know, we're excited about it. We think it'll provide for more sort of in-depth learning, more project-based learning, more cooperative learning, better learning, quite frankly. Um, and, uh, you know, it's going to challenge us as teachers to sort of mix up the, the period a little bit and not just do one thing. We're not a lecture-based school anyway, so, um, you know, I don't think they would have kids who lectured, whether it was for 40 minutes, 50 minutes, or 80 minutes, um, by and large, but particularly for 80 minutes. Um, so we're excited about it. We think there's, there's huge benefits to it pedagogically that, um, and, and our experience when we've had kids do it in other arenas, um, in certain arenas anyway, uh, it's gone great. So we're, we're thrilled about it. We think it's going to go really well. Oh, there you go. Great. Great. Thanks. All right. Can we go back to the course selection? Yep. Okay, great. So um, one of the electives that some ninth graders take, I would say many ninth graders take, is health. It's on the far right side. Um, health is a required course for graduation. It might be a good idea to, to take that and get it out of the way and satisfy that graduation requirement. Some students choose not to, not to take it in ninth grade and defer. Um, it will, you will need to take it at some point. Um, but that's uh, one elective that might fill up a letter block. It's a one-term course, so it could be um, taken in the winter, say, or in the spring. Um, and that would be scheduled on one of the other forms uh, for the winter and the spring. I see the word Harkness, but I don't see a question. If so, would you say you're very similar to a Harkness? Oh. Oh. <laughs> Uh, Harkness is a style of teaching, and I think there are some teachers that teach in that style, but uh, it's um, it would be a minority, I think. Um, so, no, I would not say we teach in the Harkness style, but it would be welcomed if there were teachers um, and disciplines for which that would make sense. Uh, in some ways, we're more of a, a kind of a seminar school where a lot of the classes do take place around a table um, with with discussion. So, so there is that there is that component. Um, but it's not um, systemic through every single class at, at Solbury. Filippo, uh, yes, one term equals one trimester. The terms yeah. are interchangeable. Yeah. Good question. Uh, most ninth graders will be in health and engineering. I would say some will be in engineering. Many will be in health. Um, I don't know if it's most. Would that historically be the case? Yes. Uh, most, right. most ninth graders will take health. At some point um, throughout the year. Yeah, it doesn't need to be in the fall. And I would say some take engineering one, those that are interested. Um, uh, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, engineering is an uh, elective. You do, engineering is not a required course. It uh, can be chosen, yep. uh, but it's not required. So it might be a good moment, Kate. The other, you know, if you're looking at another elective, you know, there are some in each academic department that you can take. Some of them are really more suitable for, for you know, older kids um, who have more background in certain subjects, but you can take many of them any year if you're really interested. Uh, the other electives that a lot of kids will take are over here in the array of, of sort of arts electives that we offer. Okay, this is really advanced drawing for me, so I <laughs> apologize. Um, but they're, you know, whether it's an art history class or an introduction, um, or an introduction to ceramics or photo or painting and drawing or 2D design or art of the book or a digital design, you know, a digital arts class um, or a music class, our chorus or the jazz band or the rock band or the ensemble or an acting, a directing, screenplay writing, etc. Plenty of those there um, for, for you to take. 
Yeah, so let me talk a little bit about our, uh, the question is about theater tech, and you can take that more than once. It's offered every term, and every term that class will help with the production that's going on. So um, you certainly can take that over and over again. Um, we definitely encourage students to pursue their interests, whether it's in the visual arts, the performing arts, uh, computers, uh, dance, and so on. Um, by the time graduation comes, you will have had to take six term classes in the arts. So taking one or two of them in the freshman year is a, is a great idea. Um, so it's good to think about how you might spread that out over, over four years. Um, it's also good to think about the big picture and the total amount of time you're going to need during the day to manage after school activity, other interests outside of Solbury, um, in addition to the academic classes. I want to take just a second to go back to world languages because I neglected to mention that um, we do have a graduation requirement in world languages and that's for students to take up through the third level of a language. So as an example, French 1, 2, and 3. Um, however, I, it needs to be made clear that if you are in learning skills English, uh, that graduation requirement uh, is waived. You certainly may take uh, world languages, but it's not a requirement. So uh, keep that in mind. If you choose not to take a world language in your freshman year, um, that can have a snowball effect in terms of you'll need to take those three courses in your 10th, 11th, and 12th grade years. So that's why it's a good idea and why many uh, ninth graders start with the first year of a language uh, to get in that system. So there was just a quick question about um, being able to get stuff done the way things will um, the meet. Noah, so if you see this conference time, that is time where you can ask teachers ex for uh, extra help or questions. And teachers, you know, may be available uh, even more than that if you just ask to meet with them. Uh, we are confident that we will be able to give enriching, challenging, and wonderful courses given the schedule. Uh, you know, it may be a little different than we've done. We're going to have to look at the content, and you know, there may be uh, you know some some breadth sacrifice for some depth. Uh, but but it's going to be strong education for sure. We uh, we feel absolutely confident in that, and absolutely confident that you'll be able to see your teacher uh, plenty given the amount of time we have set aside for uh, teachers to be available to work with you between classes. Um, and that's one of the reasons for the longer periods actually is that we can have more time where you can ask questions and, and you know get some clarity on on what's going on in class as well. Yeah, sometimes it actually makes it easier to cover a full course because. Uh, especially in, say, a science class or somewhere where you have a big setup, an art class especially, uh, where we have been running 80-minute periods in the arts for, for a long time. But um, there are some lessons, some uh, projects for which the setup and the breakdown takes, uh, say, 10 minutes each. And if, if you're in a 50-minute class period, that, that uh, really um, takes away quite a bit of time. But in an 80-minute class period, um, we can get into material deeper and not have the interruption of starting and stopping. So in some ways it can be more efficient. Right. So there have been a couple, Steve's answered a couple of questions through the, te the chat feature. Uh, I'm not going to repeat all of them, but there have been a couple others that come, have come in. So one is uh, for boarders or teachers available during mandatory study time. So not all teachers are going to be available during that time, but there are teachers who are proctoring the study halls and on duty in the dorms uh, who are definitely there to help if students have questions. Um, you know, and there are also obviously other students around uh, both that age and older students who have taken those classes who, who are there to help as well. Um, and uh, so that's there. And then the drop add date, students generally have about a week to uh, drop or add courses. Um, and, you know, if there's a situation of, well, we're not sure about whether to stay in the honors level or drop from the honors level, that drop, drop date can be extended, obviously, because it's easier. Um, adding a course later um, can be a little bit harder. So, um, but that's, that's um, I think that's that. Steve's answered that mm. one. The learning skills class counts as a credit, Colleen, uh, but not the study hall. The study hall is, is a study hall, okay? Uh, it's not an academic class that's credited or graded. Sure, I can describe a sample course load. Um, actually, do you want to pull up the scheduler? It was on the, yeah, um, that email, on the other which email. I closed. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you closed it? Yeah. Oh, I can just describe it then if you want. Um, no, you know what I can do? So what we can do is mock up real quickly what a schedule looks like. Typically, a freshman's going to take five academic classes 
and then plus, as I mentioned, maybe one or possibly two, I suppose, electives. It's it's uh, it's really their choice. Uh, here's an example. This is I'm change these a little um, bit. yeah. This is for a tenth grader, but I think um, we can change it on the fly. So Scott is populating uh, some of these classes with English nine, Spanish one. You might see them pop in. Con phys is conceptual physics. I think something happened with. Well, let's see what happens. The green isn't in there. Maybe that's a study. Uh, it, it was something. No, it, it's it, pretty it, good. B wasn't being filled. Yeah. Uh, I don't know why. Yeah, I think something happened. Um, is this your math class? Honors geometry. Okay. So these aren't filling in perfectly, but if you just look at Monday, Tuesday as an example, um, this student would have three academic classes on Monday, English, math, the honors geometry, and conceptual physics. And then the arts period, the art elective, could be any of those art classes, um, those term classes generally, that's list, that we um, showed listed. And then the next day, it's a whole new set of classes. Actually, the way we have it drawn up here, Tuesday first period looks like it might be a free period. Oh, we're inserting French too. Oh, I did it here. <laughs> oh, I see, I see. Oh, wait, it was up there. It, so. would, be, it would be up there, yeah. Looks like the green is oh, free, okay. which is fine. Yeah. You can have that be a study hall or a yeah. free period. So if you have five academic classes, as an example, one of those six blocks will be empty, or there will be a study hall in there. Um, so Scott's putting in there either free or study hall. And that's one nice thing about having that 80-minute chunk of time is you can get a lot of work done. You might be able to track down some teachers, work with your um, uh, peers, um, go to the library, whatever it happens to be. So in those two days, you can see that um, three classes are meeting on Monday, and on Tuesday, um, we have French 2 at the end of the day. Oh, this is world history. Then. World history? Okay. Um, we're populating it with world history and then, and then French 2 as an example. So this would be a typical load of five classes, and then depending on the arts. Those arts periods could be all study halls if the student chooses not to have electives there, and that gives quite a bit of time during the day to do some work. Or for the student that wants to challenge and, and fill his or her schedule a little bit more, those arts classes can be filled with, with electives. So I would call that a, a sample course load for a ninth grader. Let's see what else we have. Does the English now the English course is a year-long English nine course. Once you get to the uh, the uh, later courses in eleventh and twelfth grade, you might have more electives in English, which might be a one-term course for the fall or the winter or the spring. And Tuesday AM, um, we haven't determined exactly whether it's going to be a structured study hall or a free period yet, um, so I can't really answer that question. Some points in the day are definitely going to have structured study halls. Others may not, um, you know, particularly first period, I think, you know, if kids can come in later, sleep a little later, that's, that's not necessarily the worst thing. Are there other, other questions or thoughts about the schedule while we have it up? This, uh, Typical ninth grade schedule. It's a little bit mucky, but it's okay. It's all right. Uh, okay. So that's music and art. That's the okay. whole form, isn't it, I think? The course, uh, yeah. course selection? Yep. Okay. Um, as was mentioned, you do have an opportunity to add and drop. Uh, the best time to do that actually is before the term even starts. That will give us the best chance of getting you into your first choices. However, if you sign up for a class and the fall starts and you're, you're not feeling it or you think a different placement is, is better, uh, that first week, as, uh, as we mentioned, that first week of add drop is the time to make those changes. Um, we have quite a bit more flexibility. If, you're in an, if you want to give honors geometry as an example, if you want to give that a try, um, that we can back that down to non-honors geometry after the add drop period. It doesn't have to be just in the first week. Um, so if you want to challenge yourself and take an extra class or try an honors class, if we agree that it's a good fit and you can give it a try, you're not locked into it. You have the opportunity to add drop even after that period ends. And some, some courses will fill up. In the freshman year, that's less common because um, we, we want you to get those foundational classes. But uh, for a popular elective, and there might be limited seating, as an example for photography, uh, we only have the facility for 12 photography students. And if you're really interested in introductory photography, it is possible that it could fill up. But if you get your – excuse me? It's offered every term. That's right. So introductory photography would be available for, for a following term. But 
if you get your forms in and we get you into the system, there will be a better chance that, that um, you wouldn't be a victim of, of uh, not having enough seats in a class. But the core, the core classes, certainly there's no issue on that. Yeah. Um, okay, so we've gone over sort of course selection by department. I think we've kind of covered summer work. Um, just again about registration, you know, you got the medical mailing recently. Uh, you should have anyway, which has sort of the medical forms to fill out. And again, the other forms, and they're a combination of things relating to sort of permissions and, um, uh, you know, just finalizing transportation issues for day students. Um, to signing the, you know, having signing something that says you, you know, you and your child have read the school handbook, etc. That's all going to be under under uh, this blue bar. There'll be that registration thing, uh, probably within a week um, or so, and and that'll, you know, that'll be where you go to. But the forms themselves, right? Uh, uh, no, within right soon. I must know. The registration forms. What, in a week or is that June also? They're already ready. I mean, I thought we were giving an email about tomorrow. The course selection no, ones? No, not the course. The, oh, the registration ones. The other registration the course. The other ones will be third week of June. Okay, sorry. So the the link up here, registration, uh, et cetera, will be ready next week. And, and what you'll be able to get there at this moment are the course selection things. And, again, we'll email those to you, but they'll, they'll be there too. You'll be able to get summer reading stuff and, um, the academic building, again, is online, but might be accessible through there. Um, and placement tests, all that kind of stuff. The, the other registration forms, the permissions and all those kind of things, will be available sort of mid to end of June. Um, and we'll go from there. Uh, and that stuff's just important to do throughout the summer. It'll make the registration and orientation days in September a lot smoother to have them all done prior to uh, getting here. Um, nothing complicated, just, you know, paperwork that uh, you got to get done. Um, in terms of advisor selection, I kind of went over that also that, you know, I'll be working with, um, with, with the head of the advising system and bring my knowledge of your child to, to bear. Um, certainly if you have thoughts or ideas, we'll, we're open to those. Um, can't promise it, but we can, we can certainly talk about it. For students in the learning skills and the bridge program, those, those students advisors, uh, almost without exception, tend to be their learning skills or bridge teacher because that person works so closely with, with the students. Um, but but uh, the other people, you know, we try to find someone who we think connects uh, perfectly with your child. Uh, then important dates, just a couple of dates we wanted to go over. Again, course selections are going to be due July 8th. Uh, you'll get them in sort of, you know, mid to late June, second, third week of June, and... and um, yeah, I'll actually, we'll get you those now, and you can start working on them. But if you have questions, uh, just understand that we're going to be sort of trying to wrap up the year, and Rick in particular is going to be busy with a lot of stuff. But we can help you as we can over the next couple of weeks. But certainly, once summer hits, are, are going to be you know you're going to be more our main item of uh, of business then. Right, and so if you don't do anything for the next three four weeks, you're not behind. So uh, that's fine. You can take a breather, enjoy your children's graduation from middle school, and all the other things that are going to happen for you all right now, and um, don't don't really think too much about this right now, okay? Um, although you're welcome to if you feel like you have brain space <laughs> for it. Um, another date, we've sent this out in a couple of moments, but there's a, a welcome event on Sunday, August 28th. Um, just a casual sort of uh, outdoor event with great food and great company, chance for the students to get to know each other and sort of, you know, start forming those connections and take away some nerves, chance for parents to get to know each other, chance for you to see some faculty and administrators, obviously, and ask some questions. Uh, we'll have some current families there as well and current students, so so you get to know some people. And then orientation days. Uh, so boarders will move into the dorms on Tuesday, September 6th, and you'll get calendars that go over all this, so don't try to memorize it. That's fine. Um, and you'll move into the dorm Tuesday, September 6th, and there'll be a host of sort of orientation uh, events that day for both parents and children. Try to help everybody get settled. And um, we'll also make sure that you have all the registration forms completed that day. Uh, we'll do that. And then for day students, it's the following day, Wednesday, September 7th, um, is the day where you all will come to campus. We'll do some orientation for you and make sure you have all the registration stuff. And then the last date is Friday, September 23rd. Um, that's uh, 
you know, a class trip day where each grade goes out on a trip. For the ninth graders, we do an overnight trip so they can bond and, and connect with each other. A bunch of us, myself included, go away with them for a night to a camp in the Poconos, have a great time, and, and um, you know, it really helps them start off the year really well. So size of freshman, size of freshman class, we're looking at about 55 this year, um, which is uh, strong for us. We feel terrific about uh, about the group, so um, I couldn't be happier with it, actually, to be honest with you. Um, when do boys get lists of things to bring and roommate match? Uh, that will come sort of the next few weeks as well, I think. We'll, we'll get you, yeah, we, we'll have a sheet that we'll get you, tells you what you need to bring and, um, and roommate match. In terms of how many boarders uh, in the freshman class, uh, we're looking at probably about 15 to 17, somewhere in there by the time it's all said and done, I would guess. Uh, right now we are at 12 for 13, sorry, 13, I believe. And so uh, I have a feeling we'll add a couple more. We have a couple people working in process right now. Home room. We don't have a homeroom per se. Uh, that's uh, just not something we do. We have advisory groups and students meet with their advisor a couple times a week, um, at least twice a week. Uh, but we don't have a, a homeroom per se. And when they meet with their advisor, it tends to be maybe six students right. or so meeting with that um, teacher. So that's the closest thing we have to a homeroom. Yep. Okay. Um, I think we've covered everything on the agenda now. Uh, so you all can just kind of fire away with questions. Uh, we can do it either through the chat as we've been doing or open it up. <coughs> Fine, opening it up and see how it goes. Uh, let's give it a shot. So I have unmuted you all. Hello, anybody there? Is it true? Well, hello. They do. Yeah, learning skills uh, students will meet with their. I mean, they're they're meeting with their advisor every day, basically, because they have class with them. And um, so, but they they probably meet as a group, maybe less frequently, because they're meeting with those kids all the time. Okay. Good question. What else? Um, you can fire away with a question either verbally now or um, or hoverboard <laughs> or uh, typing it. Uh, I I think we've said no to the hoverboards actually. Oh, we have a policy. I think so. Uh, I think we get worried about them blowing up. But uh, I think someone asked to bring it this year. I don't think it's an official policy in the handbook per se yet. But I think we were a little bit nervous about it um, with people people getting hurt and different things. So. Uh, I'll look into it for you, though, Filippo. <laughs> My wife uh, might not be happy, but I've been interested in trying one. So if you bring it, I need a turn. <laughs> Learning Skills English do not give summer reading assignments. They certainly recommend that you do read. And, um, and yeah, I would look at the sort of, on the, on the summer reading list, it'll have required classes, required books for classes or reading for classes, and it will also have sort of recommended reading for different age groups uh, that are books that we think are great books for kids of that age. So I would just click on there and maybe pick a book or two um, and read it if you're in learning. No, no. And if you're looking for stuff to read, it's a great resource. I often uh, will find things there. Yep, you can definitely bring a bike. Bikes are good. Computer iPad needed this question. We'll go with him. Yeah, uh, there's a question about iPads and PCs. You definitely don't need one. There are plenty of computers all around campus, whether it's in the classrooms, in the library, or wherever students might need one. If you're a student who likes to use one in class, whatever the device is, we respect that. We think you should do whatever you need to do to be the best student you can. For some students, that's using technology. Um, so if that's the case, certainly bring it to class every day. Some students do. Um, some don't. So uh, I keep waiting to show up in my class in the fall, frankly, and have a room of you know kids in front of me all with devices, and it's not happening. There is definitely some st some students who still prefer to do things sort of the old school way. Um, but it's up. It's really up to you what you feel you need to work best in class. Uh, if you don't want it for class, there are certainly plenty of computers on campus that you can use for just. Uh, work. But we don't provide. We will not. We don't provide iPads or provide laptops. Although now and then a teacher will use a classroom set of laptops in the classroom, but we don't provide them for students to take with them back to the back to the dorms, for instance. Right. There are computers available in the classrooms for classes to use, but but not for students to take with them. All right. 
What else? Anything else, guys? Pick up kids on Friday. What was that? Uh, Sylvia asked a question, my last question. Can we pick up our kids on Fridays? And also what about lockers? Uh, oh, so for boarding students, can you go home? So boarding students, there are, there are, I think, four weekends, which we call community weekends, where all students have to stay. The very first weekend is one um, because we want students to sort of get comfortable and, and get acquainted. Those weekends, we have more required activities over the weekend and um, sort of more, they call it fundatory uh, in the boarding life here. Um, but um, beyond those, students generally have to stay for, uh, it's about half of the remaining weekends, but beyond that, they can go home if they want to. Um, and, uh, you know, it's one of the nice things for some of the families like yourself, Cindy, who uh, are not terribly far away, and you can have that ability to do that. Um, and so that's fine, you know, if you want to come get uh, Alex and bring him home uh, on an occasional weekend, that's certainly fine. Day students are assigned lockers. There, there are locker rooms, a couple of different locker areas on campus, and they will get a locker room, absolutely, a locker, so they can hold their stuff. Yeah, we're not a, I'm not a big fan of students with the bulging backpacks um, to do that, to, uh, to have to drag stuff all over campus. Um, sorry, I'm having trouble scrolling through this. I think I missed a question. Oh, sorry, Margo, there it is. Computers are in the dorms as well. Yep, absolutely, there are computers for kids to use. And then, yep, Robert, same thing. The, the drop ad period that applies to classes applies to activities as well. So if they try yoga and they hate it because they find themselves to be not very flexible um, nor very interested in deep breathing or whatever, then they can jump up to the soccer team or whatever. And there's, a, there's a separate form for after-school activities, um, which I believe will be available online. I'm not certain. But one thing I am certain is that it doesn't go to me. I tend to get those after-school activities forms. They go to our athletic director, Rob Eichem. So um, uh, look for those forms I'll, either either I'll, through an email yeah. or, or online, and um, Rob can answer questions about after-school activities. When I email all of you the course selection sheets and stuff tomorrow, I'll, I'll, I'll send you that as well. Uh, homework is listed on a website. We use a site called Moodle, and students uh, will know if they have homework or not. Uh, it's posted by 4 p.m. on a given day um, for the next day. So, yes, it will be posted on a website, and um, obviously kids are responsible for their homework. Anything else, guys? This is the beginning. You're welcome. Yeah, and um, oh, can parents log into Moodle too, Margaret? That's a great question. So, so um, no, we, um, you know, one of the things about upper school, right, that we believe is that it's a process of starting to have the students um, oversee their lives a little bit more, and 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 you all have to do it less, right? Now, that doesn't mean everybody's immediately ready for it, and so. Uh, but the students have a login, the login info for Moodle. If you would like to ask them to share that with you so you can look too, that's absolutely fine. Uh, you just have to do that, okay? Um, but but it's, a, it's a student's login information. Um, and, you know, it seems like people are starting to wrap up maybe. Um, you know, just want to emphasize again, this is the beginning, not the end, okay? Uh, oh, sorry, that, I was going to say that uh Mr. Tess, uh, or Jenny, um, the same philosophy that I just described with Moodle applies to grades as well. So we don't post grades every day. We think that that breeds sort of a preoccupation and over a hyper focus on, on the grade and not necessarily on learning, sort of gets in the way of learning sometimes. Um, certainly advisors can and do run checks on kids all the time to see how they're doing, and you're welcome to reach out to your child's advisor or teacher um, anytime and, and sort of try to get an update on how things are going. But uh, we don't do sort of the live, real-time grades. We, we, we're, we're not convinced that that helps kids in the long run, honestly. Um, so again, just to emphasize what Steve just typed, uh, I was starting to say before, you know, this is definitely the beginning, right? This is not... Uh, the, the one-time conversation on this. Uh, it was done to try to get some of the questions out of the way and to 
uh, sort of let the air out of the balloon of the unknown, right? That can be kind of scary sometimes. So just to sort of go over some things and let you know who the right people are for you and, um, and to let you know uh, some basic information about how things are going to go for the next couple months, really. Um, but, uh, but definitely feel free to, to reach out as often as you want, and we'll go forward. Anything else? Last chance for questions? Okay. So I, I think we're going to wrap it up then. Um, thank you all so much for taking the time with us. Uh, I will shoot you an email uh, probably tomorrow with some of those documents I promised. And um, best of luck if I don't talk to you so shortly uh, with wrapping up your school years and, and all the busyness that I know spring uh, end of school time seems to have. So, um, you know, best of luck with that to the students who are on the line. Congratulations on finishing up the year. Um, and again, on, on your acceptance, we are absolutely thrilled to have all of you joining us and um, look forward to, to seeing you all soon. All right. all right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank Thanks, all.